In 2103, High Elder Roger Maxon watched with apprehension as a handful of silhouettes faded into the early morning darkness. It had been nearly eight years since the satellite network had failed and he had lost contact with Paladin Elizabeth Taggarty. For all those years he had worried, not only for his old friend, but about the threat he feared had killed her. When they'd last spoken, the Paladin had been facing an apocalyptic threat. The outlook for her people in Appalachia and the continent as a whole had been grim. Finally, after years of planning and preparation, a party of volunteers was beginning the near 2,800 mile journey from California to find out what had happened in Appalachia. I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of that party of volunteers. This is the story of the Brotherhood First Expeditionary Force. The story of their cross-country odyssey begins about 25 years prior, in the run-up to the most destructive war in history. In those days, Elder Maxon was Captain Roger Maxon, second in command of a group of soldiers guarding the scientific research taking place at Mariposa Military Base. In early October 2077, the soldiers discovered exactly what it was that they were guarding. The scientists were conducting human trials of the forced evolutionary virus on military prisoners. The involuntary exposure to the virus was leaving these prisoners dead or irrevocably changed into monsters. At the news of this, Captain Maxon's commander, Colonel Spindle, lost his nerve and locked himself in his office, leaving Maxon in charge. In his new role, Captain Maxon interrogated the scientists responsible. While he had initially assumed that these experiments had been the agenda of rogue scientists or even their employer, Westech, each of them in turn claimed that these experiments had been sanctioned at the highest levels of the government. Disgusted by this revelation, on October 20th, 2077, Captain Maxon radioed the army and declared his unit to be in secession from the United States. On October 23rd, the third day after his unanswered message, the world was ended by the Great War. After sheltering in place for a few days, Captain Maxon led his men and their families to the nearby Lost Hills bunker. Once in this new shelter, Captain Maxon began to make broadcasts across the country. He still couldn't believe what he had been a part of at Mariposa. He couldn't believe that his government would sanction the FEV tests. He knew that there was another West Tech facility in Appalachia. If he could get information on that site, he would know if the atrocities committed at Mariposa were in fact sanctioned or some sort of horrible subversion by the scientists there. On October 29th, 2077, 2200 miles away to the east, Lieutenant Elizabeth Taggarty's Army Ranger Unit, Taggarty's Thunder, huddled in a cave on Spruce Knob Lake. They had just arrived in Appalachia days before the bombs, and had been wargaming when the bombs came down. In the six days since, she and her rangers had attempted to use their radio to reconnect with the chain of command. That Friday, as they scanned the channels, they heard the voice of Captain Maxon calling from across the country. Lieutenant Taggarty responded to her old friend's broadcast. She was happy to hear his voice, but she explained that she was worried that she could be charged with treason just for talking to him. He attempted to put her at ease by explaining that the country he had seceded from no longer existed. There was no one left to discipline her, much less charge her with treason. He then explained the reason he had called. He needed someone to look into the situation at West Tech in Huntersville. He needed to know if the government he had protected had truly betrayed the citizens it had been intended to serve. The arrival of Nuclear Winter forced Taggarty's Thunder to take shelter in a nearby survivalist training camp, but in the spring of 2078, they set out for the West Tech facility. With the help of a tech-savvy, friendly local, Grant McNamara, they gained access to the lockdown lab. Within, they found evidence that not only had the government been carrying out additional trials of FEV, but they'd been adding it to the water supply of neighboring Huntersville, converting the entire unsuspecting town into super mutants. While the initial discovery in California had been shocking, Huntersville gave Captain Maxon the confirmation of system-wide corruption. Even if the government were to rise from the ruins, he would not serve it. Over the next few years, he puzzled on what to do with himself and the people who looked to him for leadership. He knew that there was no going back to the way things were before, but simply maintaining the status quo was not possible either. The old world was gone, and practically everything and everyone outside of what they had brought with them to the bunker was gone with it. Depression was omnipresent. They needed a new ideal, a new mythology to devote themselves to. In the end, Captain Maxon looked to history to find his people a future. When the Roman Empire had crumbled some 16 centuries prior, Western Europe had been plunged into a dark age that lasted hundreds of years. Through the chaos and tumult of that time, the knowledge of the prior centuries might have been lost, if not for a system of monasteries in which libraries of ancient tomes and scrolls were maintained. Through the years of war, famine, and pestilence, the monks in these monasteries copied books and kept the flame of knowledge alive. 
As the centuries went by, some of these monastic orders became fraternal orders of holy warriors, cladding themselves in steel armor and training relentlessly to become elite fighters. This would be his model, a monastic order built on saving people and preserving the knowledge of the old world. There would be scribes to catalog the technology of the old world and warriors to protect them. He would command everything as the elder. The warriors would be led by his paladins. Below them would be the knights, and below them, the squires. Maxon explained his idea to Taggarty, and though she was initially skeptical, she agreed to the new organization. Thus, the Brotherhood of Steel was born. With its new structure and mission established, the Brotherhood began to expand across the region around Lost Hills. Some of the earliest recruits were former National Guard members Layla Romani and her subordinate Alan Connors. Romani soon became well known within the Brotherhood for her bold and compassionate leadership, and Connors for his wise counsel. When Romani led a party into the Mojave Wasteland, they encountered a settlement under attack by a raider band. The Brotherhood dispatched these raiders, with Knight Connors personally rescuing a young man named Daniel Shin. Impressed by the competence and the mission of the Brotherhood, Shin asked to join, and he became Knight Connor's protege. Other new members in these early years were the Valdez family. The parents in this family soon became known as the Knights Valdez, and their young daughter Odessa became an apprentice of Scribe Haley Takano. Scribe Takano, once a scientist and a writer for Tesla Science Magazine, had been instrumental in Maxon's technological success, providing the technical expertise required to contact Appalachia. Odessa Valdez took well to her new role, becoming a competent scribe with a special interest in vertebrates and other flying machines. Over those years in Appalachia, the Brotherhood was similarly recruiting and working to stabilize the region. They secured strong points at Spruce Knob and Grafton Dam, and guarded caravans across the mountainous Savage Divide. They also worked to preserve whatever technology they found, shipping it via cargo bot to special caches. Around 2082, it became clear that there was something wrong at the West Tech facility in Huntersville. While the FEV within the facility had been neutralized when they toured the site years before, new FEV-created mutants were stalking the mountains of the Savage Divide. In May 2086, the Brotherhood teamed up with another group of Appalachian survivors, the Responders, to put these super mutants down. In the aftermath of the fight, Elder Maxon congratulated them on their victory before announcing a radical change in the Brotherhood's mission. While they'd been helping people and preserving technology, the preservation of technology would become their primary goal. In Maxon's own words, Helping your fellow man is a good goal, a soldier's goal. But this, we will be the catalyst that changes the world. From this point on, the Brotherhood began to withdraw from the society of the post-apocalypse. In Appalachia, they moved their headquarters from a survivalist camp to an abandoned asylum, renaming the site Fort Defiance. It was at that asylum that they first glimpsed the monsters that would be their downfall. From across the bog, they watched an enormous bat flying around the ruined city of Watoga. Their curiosity became fear as the bat turned in their direction and flew straight for them. A few blasts from a minigun ended their first encounter as the startled beast turned tail and fled. It would soon become clear that this would not be the standard for their interactions with the beasts. Over the coming nine years, the Brotherhood in Appalachia would be engaged in a constant fight against the bats they would call Scorch Beasts or Sierra Bravos. These enormous bats carried a deadly plague that could infect almost any living thing and in the course of time turn those infected creatures into their servants. The Brotherhood attempted to contain the beasts to the bog from whence they originated, ringing the area with a series of firebases equipped with automated anti-air missile turrets. As the number of Scorch Beast attacks increased, the Brotherhood in Appalachia abandoned the mission to preserve technology, focusing entirely on the war against the beasts. The fight was one of attrition. Every attack on the disparate firebases yielded the potential for more dead, wounded, and infected. Across 2,200 miles of wasteland, the two branches of the Brotherhood worked together on technologies to fight the beasts. Scribes Grant in Appalachia and Takano in California devised a sonic generator capable of drawing the beasts in. With this sonic generator in place at Fort Defiance, the Brotherhood could concentrate their forces at an individual location, rather than remain spread across the bog. While this strategy allowed them to continue the fight, it wasn't long before these battles became too much for even the entirety of their forces to contend with. It was around this time, with their prospects for success dimming, that the satellite connection finally died. Ever since the first advanced satellites had been launched into orbit, there had been control rooms for those satellites. These facilities were staffed with teams of operators and crammed full of computers that monitored those satellites. By performing adjustments to correct their orbits, the teams kept the network operating properly. When the old world came to an end in 2077, these facilities were either destroyed or abandoned. 
By 2094, the 17 years without constant maintenance of the satellite's orbits had compounded errors from minute to massive. Satellites careened into one another, or into the wrong orbit, or into the atmosphere. Even those that remained on the proper vector had equipment fail through their extended use or because they became damaged through impacts with the debris of other satellites. Over the years, the Brotherhood had switched from one satellite to the next as they failed. In 2094, they finally ran out of utilizable satellites. As their last connection began to fade, they exchanged all the data they could, working long hours to provide the Appalachian Brotherhood with everything they could. Elder Maxon and Paladin Taggarty shared one final conversation in which he encouraged his old friend to reach out to the other survivor groups for assistance. When the connection turned to static, the Brotherhood was broken. The Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel fought on for another year before falling to the Scorch Beasts in August of 2095. Freed from their fight against the Brotherhood, the Scorch Beasts wiped the rest of humanity from Appalachia in late 2096 to early 2097. Across the country, the Western Brotherhood was worried. Their studies of the Scorch Beasts told them that they were an apocalyptic threat, not only for Appalachia, but for the rest of the continent as well. They likely hoped that somehow Paladin Tarity would find some other means by which to contact them in California, and then they could continue to provide them whatever help they could electronically. When no connection was forthcoming, the Western Brotherhood began to organize an expedition to reconnect with their Appalachian brethren, preserve technology, and if needed, fight the Scorch Beasts. The preparation for this mission was likely incredibly extensive. While a cross-country trip had once been a multi-hour affair, the bombs had returned the breadth to the continent. There was much to consider. Radioactive contamination, availability of food and water, potential raider hotspots, passable roads, and necessary river crossings. Finally, the day came and the Brotherhood First Expeditionary Force began their march across the wasteland. At the outset, the expedition consisted of five members. They were led by Paladin Layla Romani, with her second-in-command, Knight Alan Connors. The military component of the party was rounded out by Knights Daniel Shin and Matthew Thornberry. While scribe Haley Takano had been wanting to make the journey, there were concerns with how the journey would affect her existing health problems, so scribe Odessa Valdez was chosen instead. The party set off from the Lost Hills bunker, seeking a pass through the Sierra Nevada mountains. As they crossed the first great physical barrier, they encountered a band of well-armed raiders that held Brotherhood prisoners. After defeating the raiders and freeing their brethren, the expedition found that the former prisoners were too weak to travel on their own. It was decided that Knight Thornberry would escort these freed captives home, along with the captured fusion cores and energy weapons once held by the raiders. Now reduced by one, the party continued on their way, pushing east of the Sierra Nevada mountains. From the bunker, Elder Maxon broadcasted encoded missives to the travelers, hoping they would receive them even if they couldn't respond. The expedition moved through the Rockies and onto the Great Plains. It was here that they lost radio contact with the Lost Hills bunker, their transmissions fading with distance and blocked by topographical interference. They moved across the plains, passing through Lincoln, Nebraska as they went. As they continued on their way, they battled raider bands and picked up a following. After years of chaos, the well-groomed and orderly men and women wearing uniforms and power armor was a sight to behold. A slate of potential members began to travel with the expedition, including Dr. Solomon Hardy and his apprentice, Erica Hewson. Amazingly, the march didn't stop them from their mission of preserving technology, and they collected an arsenal of deadly advanced weapons, even though it added to the cargo they carried. As they drew closer to their destination, Paladin Romani began to broadcast messages to the Wastelanders in Appalachia. In these messages, she explained that the Brotherhood was coming, that they were going to use the Atlas Observatory as their base of operations, and that resources should be delivered there in anticipation of their arrival. Though garbled, the message was received by one of the locals, Russell Dorsey. Once a resident of Maryland, Russell Dorsey had joined the Settlers of Foundation when they migrated to Appalachia. When he was out exploring the region, he discovered the ruins of Fort Defiance and learned of the Brotherhood of Steel. The example his father set in his naval service was a driving force in Russell's desire to be part of a military organization. When the Brotherhood broadcasts began, he traveled to the Atlas Observatory and began to survey the site. The Atlas Observatory was a fascinating facility that housed an aborted experiment to control the weather. While there were problems with equipment failures, the head scientist, Dr. Hammond, had actually managed to alter the weather dramatically, spawning a blizzard in the heat of August. Despite this success, shortly before the war, the government shut down his funding and closed the project down. In the days after the bombs, Dr. Hammond managed to re-enter the abandoned site. He attempted unsuccessfully to restore the systems so that he could fix the weather created by the bombs. Now that the site was in Russell Dorsey's hands, he would prepare it for the Brotherhood. To start this process, he restored robots to work on fortifying the former scientific facility. 
He then initiated what he called Project Alpha, accumulating vast quantities of donated steel, concrete, cork, and plastic. After a successful month of Project Alpha, Dorsey initiated Project Bravo, collecting donations of wood, cloth, leather, and glass. As Project Bravo ended, one of the original Appalachian Brotherhood members suddenly returned to Appalachia. Initiate Dodge had been in training when one of his comrades had gone AWOL in the night. Initiate Dodge had followed him in order to get him back before he was noted as missing, but he was captured by a party of slavers. Over the years, he was transported from location to location, forced into arena fights for his captors. When the band of slavers traveled to Watoga in 2103, Initiate Dodge escaped and hid out in the Watoga Towers residential block. From this location, he began to organize operations to assist the incoming Brotherhood by contending with a myriad rising threats in Appalachia. Meanwhile, the Brotherhood First Expeditionary Force had been drawn into a local fight that lay in their path. They encountered a settlement that was about to be destroyed by an army of raiders, and they chose to step in and help. That fateful decision had drastic consequences for the expedition. For the sake of simplicity going forward, I'm going to refer to this battle as the Hellstorm. The reason behind this name will become clear with time. Regardless, when the expedition crossed into Appalachia, they were beaten and battered physically, mentally, and emotionally. After months in the wilderness, they finally arrived at the Atlas Observatory, where Russell Dorsey waited with open arms and a wealth of supplies. Though they had finally completed their near 2,800 mile journey, there was no time to rest. If they were going to survive in their new home, they would have to immediately secure their position. They renamed the Atlas Observatory Fort Atlas and began to build upon Russell Dorsey's improvements. For his role in preparing the way, Russell Dorsey was granted the rank of Initiate and put in charge of greeting new arrivals. Scribe Valdez began to explore the facility to discover the history of its operations. Knight Shin began to train the newest members of the Brotherhood. Paladin Romani began to investigate local communities and prepare plans for the creation of diplomatic ties. Whatever they'd been expecting, Appalachia was surprising. The lushness of their surroundings was heartening after the trek through the desolate wastes. It seemed that the locals may have in fact gotten a handle on the Scorched Plague situation. There was even a rumor of a vaccine created by a bunch of former vault dwellers. Despite these points of light, a shadow hung over the fort. The once friendly relationship between Paladin Romani and Knight Shin had become somewhat disjointed in the aftermath of the Hellstorm. The expedition had come out of that encounter without Knight Alan Connors. His death was far more significant a loss than simply that of a skilled warrior. Paladin Romani lost a companion that had been a constant presence throughout the madness of the post-war world. Knight Shin had lost a father figure that had saved his life and given him purpose. Beyond this, Knight Connors also served as a mediating force between Romani and Shin, tempering her compassion and his drive to create order. To add to their grief over his loss, they also had to contend with the loss of their brethren in the original Appalachian Brotherhood. They had known many of these now dead men and women through their cross-country communications. They explored the ruins of Fort Defiance, seeing for the first time the other end of those cross-country calls in person. The site had clearly been picked over in the interim, but not simply by scavengers, but also by those interested in joining the now defunct branch of their organization. Members of the public had managed to complete the process of joining the Brotherhood through their electronic onboarding system. Among these new Erzatz brothers and sisters, there was a former vault dweller of Vault 76 that would prove indispensable to the operations of the newly arrived chapter. In the fall of 2103, this former vault dweller heard Paladin Romani's radio broadcast and responded, setting out to help them however they could. They were greeted by Initiate Dorsey at the gate, and when they inquired about joining the Brotherhood, they were sent on to Knight Shin. As the only remaining knight of the chapter, Knight Shin was overwhelmed with work. Paladin Romani's broadcast was bringing in far more recruits and petitioners seeking aid than he could handle on his own. The timely arrival of the former vault dweller seeking to join up gave the knight the opportunity to pawn some of his excess workload off on another, and at the same time, use it as a test for potential admission. The dweller met with four locals, Sean Hawkman, Tally Lang, Dr. Blackburn, and Art Knapp, and they reported their petitions to Knight Shin. Sean Hawkman had been robbed by Brotherhood imposters. Tally Lang, a poorly disguised raider, sought weapons to protect herself. Dr. Blackburn, a scientist working to improve the immune systems of the common wastelander, sought equipment for his research. Lastly, Art Knapp was a farmer seeking to trade his produce for protection. The knight took this report, and then explained to the former Vault Dweller that the Brotherhood wasn't going to help any of these people. They were not the imposters. So even if there were imposters out there robbing people like Sean Hawkman, it wasn't the Brotherhood's responsibility. 
The Brotherhood wasn't going to hand out free guns. The Brotherhood wasn't in the position of lending out technology to just anyone, especially not while they were undergoing the chaos of setting up. Lastly, the Brotherhood wasn't going to make a trade deal for protection. They might protect you, but they weren't mercenaries. Satisfied with the former Vault Dweller's work, Knight Shin sent them on to obtain the recommendation of Scribe Valdez. Scribe Valdez was far more receptive to the prospective initiate, asking them to help her investigate the old observatory's substructure. Together, the former Vault Dweller and the Scribe investigated the depths of the facility, killing the numerous pests that had invaded the site over the years and damaged the equipment. Together, they inspected the damage to the site, with Scribe Valdez using the work as an opportunity to quiz the former Vault Dweller. Through this inspection, they managed to unearth a treasure locked away in the equipment, an Ultrasite battery cell. Ultrasite had been the miracle material of pre-war Appalachia. It had been created accidentally by the Atomic Mining Services Corporation, as they employed their atomic mining practices. They were pleasantly surprised to discover that a tiny quantity of ultrasite could serve as a source of immense power. Finding this battery cell in the bowels of the Atlas Observatory was a great get for Scribe Valdez, and she would, in the coming days, reverse engineer the cell, granting the Brotherhood the chance to manufacture their own. With the Scribe's glowing recommendation in hand, the former Vault Dweller went to Paladin Romani for final approval to join. The Paladin already had a mission in mind to serve as the final test to become an initiate, and thus she dispatched them to Lewis and Sons Farm Supply. The occupants of the site made it known that there was a feral ghoul nest in the area. Not only would this task test the initiate's ability to investigate and root out trouble, but if successful, they would improve the Brotherhood's relations with the locals as well. Upon their arrival at Lewis and Sons, the former Vault Dweller met the Putnam family, George, Carol, and their sons, Marty and Colin. In a somewhat rare occurrence for post-scorching Appalachia, the Putnams had a pre-war claim to the site. The Lewis of Lewis and Sons was George Putnam's cousin. He had died in the war, but when the Putnams had heard that Appalachia was livable again, they had come to live on their relative's property. The house on site was fairly well destroyed before they arrived, so they called the barn home while the repairs took place. When Marty and Colin Putnam learned that the former vault dweller was there on behalf of the Brotherhood, they were excited as they both had dreams of joining up. Mr. and Mrs. Putnam were accepting of the idea that one of their sons join up, but they needed at least one of their sons to stay behind and help them to run the farm. Strong and brave, Marty Putnam would make an excellent knight for the Brotherhood, while his brother had the intellect and curiosity to make for a great scribe. Recruitment wasn't the reason for the former Vault Dweller's visit though, and the conversation drifted back to the mission at hand. Carol and George Putnam told the former Vault Dweller that the ghouls were attacking trade caravans traveling up to Flatwoods, and that they appeared to be coming from the direction of Orwell Orchards. With this information in hand, the former Vault Dweller chose between Marty and Colin on who to recruit. With an ally secured, the former Vault Dweller headed up the hill to Orwell Orchards. After battling through a few erratic Mr. Farmhands, the former Vault Dweller entered the extensive basement shelter hidden beneath Orwell Orchards. The farm had been in dire financial straits before the war because Mr. Orwell had, without telling his wife, taken out a series of loans to pay for the construction of the shelter. When the bombs came down, they had been well positioned to ride things out, but unfortunately, the shelter's equipment began to fail. Eventually, a leaking reactor began to drive Mr. Orwell to madness, and he locked his wife away to prevent her from leaving. She managed to break out of the room, but unfortunately, he had the only key to the front door. In order to escape the basement, she had to stab him as he showered. Years later, the darkness, seclusion, and radioactivity of the old shelter created a perfect environment for ghouls. After the former vault dweller met with the Putnam boy in the basement, they put down the ghouls, eliminating the nest. With the task complete, they traveled back to Fort Atlas separately. In recognition of the former Vault Dweller's efforts, Paladin Romani elevated them to the rank of Probationary Initiate. Furthermore, she commended the Initiate for having taken the initiative to do some recruiting. Knight Shin was less enthused by the, at the time, non-member recruiting for the Brotherhood without authorization to do so. But he kept his objection to himself in deference to Paladin Romani's rank. With the needs of the people of Appalachia greatly outpacing the Brotherhood's capacity to help, the Paladin already had a task for the new Initiate. A settlement in the mire known as the Retreat was being extorted by a band of raiders, and they were asking the Brotherhood for help. The Paladin dispatched her newest initiate to handle the situation. Upon their arrival, the initiate found a formerly abandoned treehouse village now filled with wastelanders. Years ago, before the Scorched Plague scourged humanity from Appalachia, a group of Free States members had stumbled upon a treehouse while running from raiders. They had climbed up and used the treehouse to ambush their pursuers. In the aftermath of their success, they built an entire series of treehouses around the original, creating a treehouse village. 
This setup worked until they were attacked by raiders and found the treehouse's poor defense against firearms. They abandoned the village, leaving it vacant until 2103 and the arrival of these new settlers. The initiate met with the settlement's leader, Jenny Brown, and they discussed the problem at hand. The village had been doing well until they caught the attention of a local party of Blood Eagle Raiders. When Appalachia became safe for habitation once more, not all those groups that moved in were benign. One such organization was the Blood Eagles. This terrifying force of murderous raiders reveled in violence, usually perpetrating their slaughter while amped up on Psycho and Buff Out. The local band of these monstrous marauders, led by a brigand named Dagger, were bleeding the settlers dry. They demanded a regular tribute of food and other resources to prevent their wrath. Over time, the tribute requirement had grown more and more demanding, and the settlers worried that they'd likely not be able to pay soon. To make matters worse, not only did the settlers not have the means to properly defend themselves, but Dagger's people had some terrifying four-tubed missile launchers with them. Should a fight break out, the settlers would be annihilated. Ginny Brown herself didn't know where the raiders were coming from, but she believed her people might. Through a quick investigation, the initiate learned that the Blood Eagles were likely camping in and around a nearby cave. This cave, now known as Dagger's Den in honor of its current ruler, was once known as Hawk's Refuge. At that time, it owed its name to Brianna Hawk, the leader of a band of survivors that fled the scorched attack on Harper's Ferry back in 2086. The Initiate had actually already infiltrated the cave once before for their companion Beckett. A former Blood Eagle, Beckett had asked the Initiate to steal the buff out the Blood Eagles had stored there. The raiders had fortified the cave since that time, and they were ready to defend their boss and their territory with their lives. The Initiate battled through the camp's defenders and pushed into the cave beyond. As they delved into the cave, a Lieutenant of Daggers stepped out of her throne room with one of those terrifying four-tubed missile launchers and unloaded upon them. Despite the shock of the suddenness and violence of the assault, the Initiate gained the upper hand and defeated the enemy before entering Dagger's throne room. Within the cavernous room, the Initiate saw Dagger and her two bodyguards, but also a crate with the insignia of the Brotherhood of Steel on it. Dagger, not knowing that the Initiate had come to end the threat against the retreat, told them that the Brotherhood couldn't have their weapons back. She explained that they had taken them from a group of raiders and they weren't about to give them up. After the exchange of words turned to an exchange of lead, the Blood Eagle threat to the retreat was, at least for the moment, a thing of the past. And inspecting the crate with the Brotherhood's insignia, it became clear that the weapons Dagger had spoken of, the four tubed missile launchers, had once been Brotherhood equipment. The Initiate seized the cache of weapons and the supplies stolen from the retreat and left the cave behind. They returned to the retreat with their supplies and the news of Dagger's demise. With the thanks of Ginny Brown and the people of the retreat, the Initiate departed for Fort Atlas with the stolen weapons in hand. Upon their return to the fort, the Initiate found a Knight Shin reporting to Paladin Romani. He explained that their scouts had found a raider's storeroom in the Toxic Valley, and within, crates with the Brotherhood insignia. More stolen missile launchers. Because the storeroom was property of the Raiders of the Crater, rather than any other group of run-of-the-mill raiders, Paladin Romani considered the possibility of establishing a relationship and working out a deal. The Raiders of the Crater were not like the Blood Eagles. Before the Scorching, the core of this group was known as the Diehards, the one gang of the Raiders of the Savage Divide who preferred to obtain their loot through intimidation rather than killing. Though they would kill their targets if the intimidation failed, they never really developed a liking for it. They had fled Appalachia as the situation worsened and returned when it improved. Now they were living in and around the crashed space station in the Toxic Valley. Nightshin attempted to shoot down the idea of a deal with the Raiders of the Crater, but Paladin Romani changed the topic to the Initiate's debriefing rather than continue their argument in front of a subordinate. Though they disagreed on whether or not to celebrate the death of Dagger, both the Knight and the Paladin were happy that the retreat was safe again. Both were similarly unhappy to learn that the Blood Eagles had been in possession of the stolen weapons as well. Paladin Romani explained that these stolen weapons, known as Hellstorm launchers, had been acquired by the Brotherhood as they crossed the continent and, quote, unexpected circumstances, unquote, had removed them from their possession. While the Paladin and the Knight had been willing to share this scant bit of information, it seemed like there was a lot more to this story. While Knight Shin was happy to have the launchers back in the hands of the Brotherhood, Paladin Romani was still concerned for the people of the retreat. That group of the Blood Eagles was gone, but more raiders could come along and pose a threat. Knight Shin used this concern for safety to steer the discussion back to securing the stolen launchers in the hands of the raiders of the crater. Nashin ordered the Initiate to secure the storeroom and the weapons within for the Brotherhood. He would follow them there and bring a squad along as backup. 
Lastly, he requested that the Initiate investigate how the Raiders got their hands on those launchers in the first place. The Initiate set out for the Raider storeroom on the western outskirts of Grafton. Built in the years before the war, the Raider storeroom was once a makeshift vault built by a worker that built vault deck vaults, but knew that he would never get space in one for his family. Little by little, he stole supplies from his job sites and used them to build a shelter. The attempt ended in failure, with all occupants dead from one tragedy or another. Now the partially finished site was in the hands of the Raiders of the Crater. When the Initiate arrived, they found a handful of Raiders captained by a man named Pierce. Pierce confronted the Initiate and questioned if the Brotherhood had sent them. The Initiate attempted to pretend their ingress was a happy accident of an adventurous spirit. Unfortunately, this story didn't mesh with the sudden arrival of Night Shin's squad behind them. At this point, the Knight took hold of the conversation and declared that the vault and all material goods inside were now property of the Brotherhood of Steel. He claimed he did this in the drive to preserve technology and protect mankind, mildly threatening those who might resist with, Your compliance will ensure your safety. Pierce responded to this declaration by mocking the Brotherhood's seizing of the site as being in action to protect mankind. Nutshin repeated his threat and added an insult to Pierce's intelligence. Pierce mocked the insult as unbecoming of such an illustrious organization as the Brotherhood. Eventually convinced to abandon the vault and the stolen launchers, Pierce was resigned to simply asking why the Brotherhood was so interested in the launchers. Nightshin refused to continue the conversation, instead reissuing his demand that they leave the vault immediately. As he left, Pierce again mocked the Brotherhood's claim that they were protecting mankind from strong-arm raiders as they robbed another group of their supplies. As Knight Shin attempted to pry the origin of these launchers from Pierce, Pierce refused to say. He told the Knight that he didn't discuss Raider business in Brotherhood territory, and jokingly invited the Initiate back to Crater to ask. Knight Shin ordered the Initiate to get this information no matter what. The Initiate departed for Crater, leaving the Knight in a quiet rage over Pierce's insults. With the Raiders having departed, the Hellstorm launchers were shipped back to Fort Atlas, and the makeshift vault became a temporary storeroom for discoveries in northern Appalachia. Shortly after the bombs ended the world, a space station fell into the northern end of the Toxic Valley. Upon impact, it began to leak some sort of radioactive fluid that joined in the wrecking of the local environment. While it had generally been avoided before the scorching, the former diehards had made the space station their home upon their return to Appalachia. They renamed the site The Crater and remade themselves as the Raiders of the Crater. When the Initiate reached the crater, they began to search for Pierce. While most of the space station had crashed down in the center of the site, there were a few small pieces that had fallen nearby. And as it turned out, Pierce was in one of those smaller pieces the Raiders called the War Room. When they arrived, the Initiate found the Raiders discussing ambushes of Brotherhood patrols in response to their theft of the storeroom. Pierce was surprised and annoyed that the Brotherhood would actually send someone to follow up on his joke invitation. He again refused to answer, explaining that he had lied to, quote, heavily armed tyrants, unquote, so that he could get home to his people alive. Though he was ready to see the Initiate out, another raider named Sheena saw an opportunity here. They took the Initiate aside and offered them a deal. She would tell the Initiate everything she knew about those weapons if they brought her a digital copy of the Brotherhood's patrol schedule. This put the Initiate in something of a pickle. They had orders to retrieve the information on the launchers no matter what, but putting the Brotherhood at risk to do that was surely not what Night Shen had in mind. The solution to this predicament became clear when they returned to Fort Atlas. Scribe Valdez had an idea. She would provide a fake copy of the patrol schedule that would appear in every way legitimate. The Initiate agreed, and returned to Crater with his fake schedule. In thanks for this data, Sheena revealed that they had obtained the Hellstorm launchers from two sources. They had looted some from some unfortunate settlers, and traded some raiders for them as well. Sheena said that these raiders claimed to have taken them as spoils in a fight against some heavily armored foes. Furthermore, it seemed that these raiders carried a trophy, a power armor helmet with a bullet hole in the visor. Back at Fort Atlas, the Initiate reported this news to Knight Shin. It seemed that the helmet was likely that of Knight Alan Connors, the expedition member who had been slain in the Hellstorm. Knight Shin was disgusted that the raiders were carrying his mentor's armor around as a trophy. Although he adamantly wanted to go after them, he knew that his duty required him to remain at his post. Regardless, the information from Sheena gave them a new loose end to tie up. It seemed that the settlers of Foundation had been in possession of more of the launchers. Rather than simply dispatch the Initiate to Foundation, 
Knight Shin told them to report to Paladin Romani. Because this wasn't just some raider group, a level of diplomacy was involved, and that was her bailiwick. The Paladin had two missions for the Initiate. Investigate if the settlers still had any Hellstorm launchers, and work out a trade deal between the settlers and the Brotherhood. Knight Shin wasn't a fan of this potential trade deal. He believed that the Brotherhood would be stronger if it made its own supplies, rather than trade for them. But he also respected the chain of command, so he left it to Romani to make that decision. Like the Blood Eagles and the Raiders of the Crater, the Settlers of Foundation were among the Wastelanders that had arrived in Appalachia in 2103. Once members of the construction and manufacturing trades, they had brought their expertise to bear on the old Spruce Knob tourist attraction, converting the site into a settlement that they called Foundation. When they arrived, the Initiate made their way to the supply room where they met with Foundation's supply managers, Gloria Chance and her husband, Tad. When the discussion of a possible trade deal began, Gloria Chance revealed that they didn't need to buy weapons anymore because of the brand new weapons they just purchased. Tad referred to these weapons as tubes of explosive death with the Brotherhood's insignia on them. More Hellstorm launchers. When the Initiate tried to explain that the Brotherhood neither made those weapons nor sold them, Tad revealed that the Town Watch was out testing those launchers at East Mountain Lookout. Gloria made sure to note that the weapons were the property of Foundation now, and not something the Brotherhood could simply take back. With this information in hand, the Initiate made their way to the East Mountain Lookout, where they found a scene of destruction and death. Bodies and body parts were strewn in and around a large crater. Through a holotape recording, the events of the previous hours were made clear. The Watchmen had been preparing to test their new arsenal when the mishandling of a launcher resulted in a misfire, rendering all but one of the squad dead. Mike Tiller, the cause of the misfire and the sole survivor of the test, had fled the site with the launchers. By reading a terminal that had been left behind, the Initiate was able to track Mike to Kerwood Mine. Before the war, Kerwood Mine had been managed by a fool who obtained his job through nepotism. After the war, the original Appalachian Brotherhood had scouted the mine and found the tunnels were flooded. The Initiate found Mike Tiller hiding behind a security gate. When they tried to reason with him, he refused to come out and face the relatives of those he had accidentally killed. After swimming through the flooded mine and killing their way through an army of mole miners, the Initiate found the back way into the room and confronted Mike Tiller again. This time they managed to convince him to return to Foundation and to face up to what had happened. The Initiate carried the launchers back to Foundation's storeroom. Gloria and Tad were horrified at the result of the test fire of the Hellstorm launcher, but they still felt they couldn't just hand them over. They'd paid a lot for them, and they couldn't take that financial hit and still sign a trade deal with the Brotherhood. To cover their losses, the Initiate paid them 2,500 caps from their own pocket. The trade deal secured, the Initiate returned to Fort Atlas with the Hellstorm launchers in hand. Paladin Romani was shocked and thankful for the generosity of the Initiate, while Knight Shin was concerned that this might make the Brotherhood appear to be a charity organization. Having solved the Hellstorm launcher problem for the time being, the Paladin and the Knight decided to meet with Scribe Valdez as she had some news to share. Scribe Valdez had detected a low frequency signal in the area, a signal that she believed they could use to contact California. Knight Shin was thrilled by this news. Re-establishing contact had been the number one priority given by Elder Maxon before they left California. Paladin Romani though was upset. She had made strengthening their presence in Appalachia their highest concern, and the discovery of this signal seemed to her an indication that effort was being spent on non-essential purposes. The scribe apologized and explained that she had heard Night Shin speak of re-establishing contact so many times that she had taken the initiative to set up a signal tracer to run passively as they performed the tasks to accomplish the Paladin's goals. In a sign of the growing rift between them, the Paladin and the Knight argued openly about the chapter's priorities in front of Scribe Valdez and the Initiate. Realizing the scene they were making, Paladin Romani sent Scribe Valdez and the Initiate off to discuss the next steps in locating the source of the signal. Once they were alone together, Together, Scribe Valdez apologized to the Initiate for having seen the fight. She quickly refocused the conversation on the matter at hand, and explained that she had tracked the signal to somewhere northwest of Vault 76. It was likely some sort of advanced military facility as low frequency communicators were used to contact submarines before the bombs. Though the signal was weak, the ultrasight battery cell found in the bowels of Fort Atlas would boost it. Before the Initiate left to find the signal source, they couldn't help but to ask why Knight Shin and Paladin Romani were at each other's throats. Scribe Valdez didn't yet feel comfortable talking to the Initiate about the Hellstorm in detail, but she referenced it in passing, as the cause of the Knight and Paladin's acrimony. She hoped that reconnecting with Elder Max 
Jackson would help to rebuild their relationship. With the information on the transmitter in hand, the Initiate departed Fort Atlas for the signal transmitter. What they didn't know was that there had been concerns amongst the elders in California that Romani had been using this mission to effectively create her own Brotherhood of Steel. While Romani had always been loyal to the Brotherhood, she clashed regularly with the elders on this mission. In the encrypted transmissions sent to the expeditionary force as they traveled, it had become clear over time that even High Elder Maxon feared that she was going to attempt to separate from their leadership. The events that were to take place in the coming hours would show Paladin Romani's true colors and define the future of her relationship with Night Shin. The Initiate tracked the source of the signal to transmission station 1AT-U03. On the surface, this structure appeared as innocuous as any of the half dozen radio towers in the region. A closer inspection revealed that this site was anything but. When they found a handprint scanner, the Initiate was startled to discover that their hand granted them access to the facility. In the months after they emerged from Vault 76, the Initiate had been forced to become a general in the Enclave in order to use Appalachia's nuclear weapons against the Scorch Beast threat. This handprint scanner recognized them as a general, and as such, it granted them access. The Initiate entered a personnel transportation tube and descended into a previously unknown subterranean facility. As an Enclave station, this was nothing like the Congressional Bunker at the White Spring. While that site was clean, well lit, and patrolled by an army of robotic servants, this bunker was dusty, dim, and appeared to be abandoned. The Initiate approached a console at the center of the foyer and was greeted by the synthetic voice of Sotus, welcoming them to Enclave Research Facility Site J. When the Initiate requested access to the transmission equipment, Sotus responded by saying, Task entered. Estimated wait time, 14,320 hours, 12 minutes. Even pulling rank as a general only cut the wait time to 6,598 hours, 42 minutes. With that time obviously running far too long for the initiate, they asked if there was another way to use the transmitter. Sotus responded that they could walk there, and although she recommended against it, she pointed to decontamination as the place to start the journey within. It was in decontamination that the initiate first found the remains of the human staff of the bunker, their corpses lying under the decontamination arches. As they delved further into the facility, it became clear that Sotus had become homicidal. I've told the full story of this facility in a video covering Enclave Site J, but for this video it will suffice to say that she pumped the Scorched Plague from the surface into the bunker and it turned the human staff into the Scorched. After several fights, the Initiate reached the administration room for the site. Here, they added their credentials to the system and gained access privileges to the deepest sections of the bunker. As their path led back to the foyer, Paladin Romani and Night Shin arrived. Together, the party of three entered the transmission room and were immediately assaulted by Sotus herself in the body of a sentry bot. After dispatching the homicidal intelligence, the work to restore and utilize the transmission equipment began. Paladin Romani sent Night Shin and the Initiate to add the Ultrasight battery cell to the power source in the next room. While working together, the Knight finally let out all the problems he had with Romani that she was too giving, too trusting. He feared that her mind was too open and that it might well be their downfall. He then sent the Initiate back to Paladin Romani to make sure that she didn't do anything to the transmitter while he was working on the power source. Alone with the Initiate, she revealed her true plans. She was ready to separate this chapter from the rule of the Western Elders. She saw the Elders as cowards, refusing to use the technology they safeguarded to rebuild the world. In Appalachia, she saw an opportunity for the Brotherhood to help the people to build a new future. She claimed that restoring contact with the Elders might well destroy them. To explain this stance, she finally told the Initiate some real details on the Hellstorm. The Brotherhood had claimed the entire cache of Hellstorm missile launchers at a military facility in the Midwest. When they came across the town that was about to be massacred, they chose to fight alongside the settlers and arm them with the launchers they carried. Nearly the entire town was destroyed. Doling out the launchers before the battle was expressly forbidden by the Brotherhood's rules. She feared that if Knight Shin were able to talk to the Elders, he would feel compelled to confess their actions, and they would be stripped of their titles and lose all authority. Everything they had worked for would be destroyed. However, if they couldn't make contact, then technically, they could remain sanctioned. She also feared that if the Elders heard how this unsanctioned release of dangerous technology had turned out, they would feel justified by this one incident to stay the course in hoarding technology going forward. She then asked the Initiate where their loyalties lay. With her, or with the Elders? Regardless of the Initiate's choice, as Night Shin returned to the transmitter, Paladin Romani drew a spear and plunged it deep into the equipment, destroying it 
and the chance to contact the elders along with it. This was the last straw for Knight Shin. He declared that Paladin Romani had broken her oath to the Brotherhood, that she was no longer worthy of the title of Paladin. He proclaimed himself to be the highest ranking officer in the Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel, and therefore was in charge. As the two of them began to bicker about who really controlled the chapter, an emergency alert came through. Fort Atlas was under attack. Romani and Shin agreed to put their argument on hold until the current danger had passed. The Paladin, Knight, and Initiate departed Enclave Site J and raced back to the fort. Upon arrival, the exterior of Fort Atlas was strangely calm for having just issued an emergency alert. Entering the facility made the reason for the alarm clear. Super mutants had burst through the basement walls of Fort Atlas and attacked. Scribe Valdez had led the defense, pushing the mutants out of the fort and establishing a barricade in the basement but she feared that the barricade wouldn't hold for long. Wave after wave had hit the defenses, and scouts were reporting that the extensive tunnel system connected to the breach was crawling with mutants. Even in the face of imminent danger, Shin and Romani managed to slip into another argument over how to tackle the situation. Paladin Romani wanted to take the fight into the tunnels, while Knight Shin wanted to hold the line. Scribe Valdez, frustrated with the bickering, suggested a third way. Most of the forces would remain behind and hold the line, while a second, smaller party would enter the tunnels with some explosive charges and collapse the tunnels at key points. Knight Shin agreed to this plan, and together, the Knight, the Paladin, and the Initiate entered the tunnels, leaving Scribe Valdez to continue her command of the defense. The trio of sappers fought their way through a series of caves, mine shafts, and tunnels, the knight and paladin bickering as they went. Reaching the choke points, the initiate set the charges and Knight Shin set them off, sealing the tunnels. With the attack thwarted, the trio returned to Fort Atlas. Paladin Romani led the mission debrief, extolling the strength of the Brotherhood and defeating the monstrous attackers. The celebration was short-lived though, as Knight Shin wasn't going to let what happened at Enclave Site J pass without repercussions. He demanded Paladin Romani answer for her actions. Scribe Valdez, still out of the loop as to the cause of the current fight, finally demanded to know what had happened. Paladin Romani explained that she had destroyed the transmitter to break their chapter free from the oversight of the elders. Knight Shin accused the Paladin of simply attempting to avoid responsibility for her failures in the Hellstorm. He couldn't see a way back to the way things were before Enclave Site J, but he recognized the danger inherent in the mutant attacks. In the interest of the safety of the Brotherhood, Knight Shin agreed to put his feud with Hermani on hold until the threat was dealt with. As the Knight and Paladin left, Scribe Valdez was shocked by what she had heard. She had known that Romani didn't get along with the Elders, but her actions were alarming. Along with this, Knight Shin had never been so insubordinate before. Though Scribe Valdez trusted Paladin Romani, she feared that without the Elders to temper her actions, she might get the chapter in trouble. Unfortunately, the schism between Romani and Shin was not the biggest problem facing the Appalachian Brotherhood at the moment. For the next several months, Fort Atlas, along with other sites across Appalachia, would come under attack from more super mutants. Like those that had tunneled into Fort Atlas, these mutants would show a higher than normal intelligence level, and it made them just that much more dangerous than the run-of-the-mill super mutant. As much as Paladin Romani might have wanted to take the fight to the mutants, for the moment, they had no idea where they were coming from. For that, they'd have to wait for some sort of information on their source. In the fall of 2104, that information finally arrived. In a message delivered to Initiate Russell Dorsey, the Settlers of Foundation revealed that they believed the source of the mutants to be Uncanny Caverns, a tourist attraction outside Lewisburg. The Initiate carried this message to the Paladin and Knight, and found the pair again bickering over the proper response to the continued mutant assaults. While Paladin Romani wanted to defend as many Wastelanders from the attacks as possible, Knight Shin was pushing for holding their forces back, so as to not overextend them. With the news about the potential sores at Uncanny Caverns, Knight Shin vowed to lead a strike team to stop the attacks. Though Paladin Romani protested the splitting of the Brotherhood's forces, she agreed to his plan. For his strike team, Knight Shin chose the Initiate, Initiate Norland, and Initiate Hewson. He sent the Initiate to find the other two and brief them on their mission. Initiate Norland was from Ohio, where his parents had worked for the federal government before the war. He viewed his service to the Brotherhood in restoring the world as penance for their contribution to its downfall. Physically fit, brave, serious, and obedient, Initiate Norland embodied everything Knight Shin valued in a member of the Brotherhood. 
Unlike Initiate Norland, Initiate Hewson was jumpy, timid, and bookish. However, she was a skilled medic who had once been the apprentice to Dr. Solomon Hardy. Both she and Dr. Hardy had met the expedition on its way across the country and joined up. Though she had not participated in any combat for the Brotherhood, Initiate Hewson was devoted to her brethren. When the Initiate found her, she was comforting young Maximo Leone on the sudden disappearance of his sister. It was clear that the Knight was hoping that seeing some action in the presence of his favorite Initiate might help to improve Initiate Hewson's temperament. Once alerted to their mission, the Initiates set out to meet Knight Shin at Uncanny Caverns, seeking the source of the relentless mutant attacks. Upon arriving in the caverns, Knight Shin briefed the trio of initiates on their mission before they moved further in. A short distance into the cave, they encountered and killed a Myrler. While not dispositive, the presence of regular local wildlife made the cave seem a less likely lair for the mutants. Regardless, the team traveled deeper in, soon making contact with floaters. A typical companion species to super mutants, this was a good sign. Finding themselves at an apparent dead end, the knight dispatched the initiates to search for any way forward. The initiates found a collapsed passage they might be able to reopen, and a narrow passage they might be able to crawl through. Knight Shin ordered initiates Norland and Hewson into the narrow passage, and set the initiate on finding a way through the collapse. Upon opening the way through with a shovel, the Initiate and Knight Shin found themselves battling white-skinned super mutants covered in red battle paint that burst through the newly opened gap. With these mutants defeated, the Knight realized the danger that the other Initiates were in. Knight Shin was berating himself for having risked their lives when a panicked radio message came in from Initiate Hewson. Though garbled, it was clear that there was something wrong with Initiate Norland. The Knight and the Initiate pushed on and discovered the grim reality of the situation. Initiate Norland was dead, and Initiate Hewson was nowhere to be found. Shin again berated himself for his failure. After the Hellstorm, he had sworn to never let those under his command die like that again. But here, his orders had left one of his charges dead and the other missing in action. Knight Shin wasn't going to let Hewson join in Norland's fate. Together, the Knight and the Initiate searched for any sign of her. Following a trail of blood, they pushed through another narrow passage. On the other side, they found the lost Initiate. She was standing on a tripped trap unable to move without setting off an explosion that would kill her and anyone nearby. Knight Shin, confident that his armor could take the blast, charged in and dove on the bomb, taking the damage himself. While Knight Shin lay wounded on the floor, the Initiate and Initiate Hewson heard more super mutants coming to kill them. In a desperate battle, the two Initiates managed to hold their ground as more and more mutants arrived. When the waves of mutants finally abated, Initiate Hewson tended to Knight Shin, leaving the Initiate to search for any clues as to the origins of the mutants. In their search, they found a damaged Pip-Boy, creating the possibility that the mutants had originated in some nearby vault. Knight Shin ordered the Initiate to take the Pip-Boy to Scribe Valdez for inspection. He and Initiate Hewson would follow as soon as he was well enough to stand. Returning to Fort Atlas, the Initiate found Scribe Valdez fretting about the disappearance of Marsha Leone. This was just the latest in a string of disappearances being reported across the region, making the Scribe worried. Marsha and her brother Maximo were the only survivors of the settlement lost in the Hellstorm. The Brotherhood had brought them along rather than leave them to fend for themselves. While Maximo spoke often of his dreams of being a knight, Marsha was less enthused by life in the Brotherhood. Scribe Valdez felt responsible for both of them, and beyond this, she considered Marsha to be a friend. She took the Pip-Boy to run some diagnostics on it, but asked the Initiate to look into Marsha's disappearance. Marsha was said to have taken a trip to Foundation, but a group of Initiates that had recently returned from the settlement had seen no trace of her there. Scribe Valdez suggested that the Initiate speak with Marsha's brother Maximo as a first step. Maximo told a similar story. She had told him she was going to Foundation. Despite this, he did note something strange about the way she said goodbye. While as a child, Maximo only recognized her behavior as strange, it was immediately clear that she was likely planning on leaving. The nature of the investigation changed from a possible kidnapping to a possible runaway. The investigation led next to Louise Ramirez, Marsha's best friend. Louise tried to cover for Marsha, but was a poor liar and quickly crumbled under questioning. Marsha had indeed left of her own volition, and she'd gone to join the war party of the Raiders of the Crater. She had stayed as long as she could to ensure Max's safety, but she was not fond of the Brotherhood, as she blamed them for the death of her mother in the Hellstorm. Once she had Luisa's assurance that he would keep her brother safe, she charged off to Crater. Thus, the Initiate departed once more for the War Room. When they arrived, the Initiate indeed found Marsha in the War Room, conversing with Pierce, the Raider whose wit had enraged Knight Shin within the makeshift vault. Marsha and Pierce were discussing the disappearance of two raiders, Sheena and Burke, the former of whom the Initiate had given the false Brotherhood patrol data to the year prior. 
Marsha was less than happy to see the Initiate, and she told them angrily to leave. The Initiate noted the absence of Sheena and Burke, which yielded a sardonic and dismissive remark from Pierce. Marsha, on the other hand, practically exploded with concern for the two, and she blabbed the circumstances of their disappearance. Stunned by Marsha's oversharing, Pierce corroborated her story. Sheena and Burke had been on a mission to Atomic Mining Services in Watoga, and they hadn't returned. Marsha was feeling guilty about this because it had been her piece of intel, stolen from the Brotherhood, that had both gotten her a place in the Raiders and that had resulted in Sheena and Burke going on this trip. The Initiate agreed to help Marsha to fix her problem in spite of her claims that she was not coming back to Fort Atlas. The Initiate traveled to Watoga and entered Atomic Mining Services headquarters, where they found Marsha Leone doing battle with a group of mercenaries known as the Hellcats. Once the lobby was cleared, the Initiate and Marsha could finally talk alone. Marsha explained that she had run away because being surrounded by the Brotherhood was a constant reminder of how her mother died. She hadn't asked to be brought to Fort Atlas, she was trying to create a life of her own. She reasoned that the Raiders were the only ones standing up to the Brotherhood in their oppression. With that settled, the two of them headed upstairs together, where they were forced to do battle with a number of additional Hellcat mercenaries and AMS security robots. In finding a necklace that belonged to Burke, they knew they were on the right track. Not long after this, they found a dead raider that had accompanied Sheena and Burke to AMS. This made Marsha more anxious, but again proved they were on the right path. Further up, they found a note from Sheena indicating the raiders were preparing to surrender to the Hellcats. Upon entering the executive boardroom on the top floor, the Initiate and Marsha found more Hellcats and their squad leader, Kit. After a battle against Kit, some Hellcat minions, and a number of robots, the Initiate and Marsha discovered a strange note. It appeared that someone with the initial B had hired the Hellcats to perform kidnappings, including the raiders they'd captured here. Beyond this, the note spoke of acquiring people from the Blue Ridge Caravan Company. This floor cleared, the Initiate and Marsha descended via personnel tube to the lobby. From there, it was a short trip to the basement to find Sheena and Burke. Once again, the Initiate and Marsha found themselves fighting a half dozen Hellcats. Once these guards were dealt with, they managed to free Sheena and Burke. Having won her respect, the Initiate was finally able to have a real conversation with Marsha, and she revealed more of the story of the Hellstorm. In the face of a raider assault, the Brotherhood distributed the launchers amongst the citizens of the town. Somehow, the raiders managed to simply take the weapons and slaughter the people, her mother included. Marsha believed that if they had just surrendered, they would have lived. In one final attempt to get her to come home, the Initiate reminded Marsha that without her there to guide him, her brother Max would end up a subservient bootlicker. This finally convinced her to give up the raider's life and go home and take care of her brother, and to be near her friends. With the task complete, the Initiate left AMS behind and returned to Scribe Valdez at Fort Atlas. The Scribe was happy to see that Marsha was back, but her mood faded when the Initiate shared the letter they found at AMS from B. It seemed they finally had some news about the disappearances. The Scribe tasked the Initiate with bringing this information to Paladin Romani as quickly as possible. When the Initiate found Paladin Romani, she was conversing with a frustrated Art Knapp. The farmer that had once come to Fort Atlas to trade his produce for protection was now asking for help to find his missing niece, Cassie Halloway. Cassie had sent him letters saying she would soon travel with the Blue Ridge Caravan Company to come see him. She never arrived. When he went to ask after his niece, the Caravan Company told him that she had never traveled with them. This latest case of a missing person connected perfectly with the letter from B regarding the acquisition of people from the Blue Ridge Caravan Company. The letter connected a few dots for the Paladin. She'd been suspicious of the Blue Ridge Caravan Company ever since the boss had refused to meet with her. Beyond this, in traveling across the continent, they had encountered raider and slaver bands disguised as caravans. The Paladin decided that an investigation of the Caravan Company was now an immediate necessity, and with Night Shin still wounded from the encounter at Uncanny Caverns, she was going to involve herself directly. She would travel incognito to their local headquarters at the western end of the Big Bend Tunnel. She ordered the Initiate to likewise disguise themselves and then travel separately to meet her there. Before the scorching, the camp at the western end of the Big Bend Tunnel had been held by a group of reformed cutthroat raiders of the Raiders of the Savage Divide. A lot of the raiders were able to justify their lifestyle a lot of the time because it allowed them to survive. David Thorpe, the boss of the Cutthroats, had shattered that illusion when he flooded Charleston on Christmas Day 2082, killing hundreds. This act of wholesale, meaningless slaughter had been too much for some in his organization. Those conscientious objectors left the Pleasant Valley Ski Resort and settled at the western mouth of the Big Bend Tunnel. 
If you're interested in these people, I created an entire lore video on their story, but what I've told you so far should suffice for the purposes of this story. When the Blue Ridge Caravan Company came to Appalachia in 2103, they found the old reformed raider camp empty and they turned it into their local headquarters. I also have a lore video covering the Blue Ridge Caravan Company, but we'll cover the parts important to this story over the next few minutes. When the initiate arrived, they found Paladin Romani in the local bar. They sat down together for a drink and they talked going deeper into personal issues than would normally be appropriate between a superior officer and her subordinate. The paladin expressed her frustrations dealing with Knight Shin, as well as her ongoing sadness over the loss of Knight Connors in the Hellstorm. She had made the decision to help the settlement battle the raiders. She blamed herself for Knight Connors' death, and his death for creating the rift between herself and Knight Shin. They finished their drinks with a toast to Knight Connors before going upstairs to meet with Joanna Mayfield, the Blue Ridge Caravan Company president. Joanna immediately made it clear that she had excellent intelligence on the region, greeting the disguised paladin by her rank and the initiate as a vault dweller. She explained that she had finally taken the meeting with the paladin because the caravan was investigating the disappearances on their routes and they knew the Brotherhood was too. She explained that part of their investigation involved lying to Art Knapp when they told him that his niece had never traveled with them. She wanted to keep the investigation in-house to avoid scaring off the perpetrators before they were caught, and because she felt the company owed it to those that they had lost in route. As for why she hadn't agreed to meet with Paladin Romani before, she explained that she didn't want to have to deal with the pseudo-authority of the Brotherhood, nor the regulations that a relationship with them might bring to her company. Paladin Romani didn't believe her explanations. She argued that the investigation had been kept in-house to keep the bad news from hurting their bottom line. When the Paladin questioned Joanne Joanna Mayfield about the letter from B to the Hellcats, Joanna explained that the letter seemed to her to be regarding her company as a target rather than as an accomplice. Joanna Mayfield knew that Romani wasn't going to accept a simple statement of innocence. She offered a guided visit to the last known location of Art Knapp's niece, Cassie Halloway. The guide for this trip would be a caravan guard named Ares. Ares told the Paladin and the Initiate that Cassie Halloway's entire caravan had gone missing from their camp in the Harper's Ferry train tunnel. The tunnel covered an entrance to a gas pipeline that the company used to transport caravans discreetly in and out of the region. Cassie's caravan of 15 had arrived at the company camp. By the next morning, all 15 had vanished without a trace. With this news in hand, the Paladin, Initiate, and Ares set out for the Harper's Ferry train tunnel separately. The Initiate and Paladin met at the entrance to the tunnel as Ares scouted further ahead. In spite of the cooperation from the Blue Ridge Caravan Company, the Paladin still didn't trust Joanna Mayfield or Ares, but she was willing to go along with things for the time being. Together, the Brotherhood team fought through a tunnel filled with feral ghouls before they arrived at a small alcove where Ares was waiting. With a few tweaks to a Bish Natural Gas Company calendar on the wall, Ares opened a secret passage to the Bish Pipeline Pumping Station beyond. Once a Bish employee, Ares had been the first to recommend this route to the Blue Ridge Caravan Company. The party of three entered the secret tunnel, and after a few feral ghoul attacks, they arrived at a massive locked door. It turned out that when initially investigating the disappearances, Ares had triggered a false gas leak alarm to seal the door that blocked access to the camp in order to keep others from using the company route. The system required a verification of an all clear from the nearby pump room before the door could reopen. Unfortunately, while this once would have been easy to work around, the wild growth of the mire outside had created a problem. Fast growing and incredibly strong red strangler vines had grown through the reinforced concrete wall of the station and created an impassable barrier blocking the way to the pump room. To find a way past the vines, they were forced to explore the station. The Brotherhood team discovered that some of the Bish Company employees that had been operating the site when the bombs fell had survived in the station for some time after the war. When the Red Strangler vines grew into the station, one of the employees claimed to have formulated a chemical that would weaken the vines. While it appeared to work and the other employees cheered his genius, the celebration was short-lived. The truth of the matter was that he had simply added a tiny amount of herbicide to the station's water supply and that this had weakened the vines without causing any harm to his co-workers. Over time, he had to add more and more herbicide until his co-workers died vomiting. The Paladin and the Initiate managed to get the drinking water system pumping herbicide-laden water again, which weakened the vines. The weakened vines were no match for a little firepower, and the way forward was opened. The Paladin and the Initiate arrived in the pump room, and they found the proper terminal. Upon attempting to signal an all-clear, the system told them that it had to run a pump integrity test a test that couldn't be completed due to the presence of a hostile robotic 
entity. The unmistakable cry of an imposter sheep squatch rent the air. In this case, it was a sheep squatch imposterling rather than a full imposter, but it was hardly less deadly than the real imposter. After a nasty battle with a high-powered, fur-clad Assaultron, they learned the disturbing reason for its presence at the station. The company had ordered its creator, Calvin Van Lowe, to program the bot to locate all company employees and eliminate them. The initiate knew of Calvin Van Lowe from an investigation into his disappearance the year before. Calvin Van Lowe was a member of the Van Lowe family of Lewisburg that had operated Van Lowe Taxidermy. After graduating from vault -Tec University, Calvin had worked for Bish, creating the Sheep Squatch imposter to scare the people of Lewisburg off their land so that Bish could buy it up cheap. It seemed that Calvin had a special fondness for his creation and attempted to implement a, <clears throat> a Sheep Squatch mating ritual program. The audio recording of this program failing in the pool of blood in the Van Lowe taxidermy basement made the initiate believe that Calvin Van Lowe had been killed, but there was something about Ares that made them question that assumption. Regardless, with the imposterling dead, the paladin and the initiate managed to get the system to read all clear, and they returned to Ares at the door to the camp. Ares opened the way, and the party moved forward to a series of fairly sizable rooms built into the train tunnels. The initiate began a search of the site, and indeed found that Cassie Halloway and the rest of the caravan had been there. Cassie's journal spoke of her trip to Appalachia with the caravan. While the trip started out fairly boring, her writings included references to a creepy, bald doctor that she caught staring at her. The day they reached the camp, they were forced to stay in the tunnel thanks to a rad storm raging outside. That night, she found that the caravan had been joined by a party of heavily armed men that were chatting with the creepy, bald doctor. They then disarmed the caravan guard. Her journal ended with a cry for help. Searching further, the initiate found a caravan manifest, with one passenger appearing on the manifest for three separate caravans, Dr. E. Blackburn. One passenger had disappeared on each of the first two trips. Now, Cassie's entire caravan was missing. Pieces started to come together. The initiate remembered Dr. Blackburn showing up at Ford Atlas on their first day in the Brotherhood back in 2103. He had been there looking for equipment to perform experiments that would improve people's immune systems. Then there was the letter from an individual with the initial B to the Hellcat mercenaries seeking abductees for testing. Now, there was news of Dr. Blackburn traveling on these caravans as passengers disappeared one by one, and now all at once. The initiate brought this news to Paladin Romani, who subsequently came to the conclusion that Dr. Blackburn and his hired Hellcat mercenaries were behind the many kidnappings. She apologized to Ares for having prejudged him and the caravan before she and the initiate returned to Fort Atlas separately. Arriving back at Fort Atlas, the initiate found Paladin Romani, Knight Shin, and Scribe Valdez discussing the Dr. Blackburn situation. While they were still not completely sure where he was, the scribe had unearthed a clue as to the origin of the super mutants that had been assaulting Appalachia. She had managed to break the encryption on the Pip-Boy scavenged by the initiate in Uncanny Caverns and found that it came from Vault 96. Thanks to some additional research, she'd been able to locate the vault in the Southern Savage Divide, but couldn't determine what it housed. Night Shin felt the super mutant threat took priority over the abductions, the Paladin felt the opposite. Luckily, the Paladin believed the two issues were connected, so she had no problem prioritizing the mission to Vault 96. To this task, the Knight and the Paladin assigned both the Initiate and Scribe Valdez. They were ordered to infiltrate the vault and find any evidence connected to the abductees or the super mutants. Furthermore, if he was at the site, they were to capture Dr. Blackburn alive. They departed immediately and separately for Vault 96. Upon arrival, the Initiate had meant to use their Pip-Boy to access the vault, but they instead found that the door was hanging ajar, appearing as though it had been wrenched open. Entering the vault, they found a strange amount of ice and several dead Hellcat mercenaries. About halfway into the entrance hall, the initiate found a Hellcat that was dying rather than dead. Corporal Woods revealed that they'd been guarding the vault on the behalf of Dr. Blackburn when it was struck by Blood Eagle Raiders. The mercenaries were surprised by the Raiders. They'd assumed that being so far out of the way that they weren't a target. Their first indication that something was wrong was a bunch of live grenades flying through the door. Corporal Woods revealed that Dr. Blackburn was indeed behind the kidnappings, and that the abductees were in fact brought to the vault. She died of her wounds shortly after. The initiate then took the opportunity to signal Scribe Valdez with the vault's emergency transponder. She arrived immediately. The initiate caught the scribe up on the ongoing events, and she went to the entry console to see if she could make use of it. The vault was in lockdown, and the automated defenses were engaged in battle with the Blood Eagles. The scribe and the initiate advanced to the next door, and they found it locked. 
The scribe utilized a console to hack the door open and grant them access to the inner vault. The Brotherhood party fought their way through dozens of blood eagles and security robots, learning the story of Vault 96 and Dr. Blackburn along the way. I've detailed both of these subjects in their own videos, and I suggest you check them out. For the purpose of this video, it should suffice to say that Vault 96 had a lot of DNA alteration equipment, and Dr. Blackburn was using that to rework the forced evolutionary virus towards its original purpose. In the years before the war, there had been a bioweapons scare. To counter this, the defense contractor Westech had been commissioned to create a universal inoculation against all disease. This work, known as the Pan Immunity Variant Project, did not last long, as early tests showed that the PVP caused an increase in strength, size, and intelligence of the test subjects. These results caused the PVP to switch tracks to become the FEV. The goal was no longer immunity and good health for every American, it was the creation of super soldiers. Dr. Blackburn had been hired by Westec to work as a scientist on the PVP just before the changeover, and he wanted to finish the work as it was intended. In the process of this work, creating new strains of FEV, he created a large number of relatively intelligent super mutants. After several fights, the initiate and scribe Valdez found a blood eagle that was willing to negotiate. In a strange coincidence, this talkative blood eagle turned out to be Tally Lang, the raider in disguise that had shown up to Fort Atlas looking for weapons the same day as Dr. Blackburn was there. Tally and her raiders were in a bad way. They were cut off with waves of robots coming down on them. She and the initiate worked out a deal. The Brotherhood would help them escape, so long as Tally Lang handed over a security keycard she had found. They followed through and helped the Blood Eagles fight the robots off. Tally Lang, for her part, handed over the keycard and went on her way. Finally, after a long search, the Initiate and the Scribe found the abductees, or at least those that remained. Luckily, Cassie Halloway was among those that had survived. Most of them that hadn't been killed were too weak to travel, but Cassie Halloway was well enough to take care of them until more help arrived. With one goal achieved, the Initiate and the Scribe moved against Dr. Blackburn. When they reached the door to the Overseer's quarters, they found the security card ineffective. Unfortunately, Dr. Blackburn had changed the credentials when he lost the card. He attempted to talk the Brotherhood into leaving, but Scribe Valdez wasn't going to be denied. She traced the hydraulic connections that kept the door up and found a weak point. With just the turn of a valve, the door fell open. Upon entering the Overseer's office, the doctor surrendered immediately and offered to cooperate fully. A quick interrogation revealed that the doctor believed that he had completed his corrected FEV. Further, he had plans in motion for it to be dispersed over Appalachia. Scribe Valdez radioed out a call for a team to secure the vault and sent the Initiate back to Fort Atlas to explain the situation to Paladin Romani. By the time the Initiate arrived at Fort Atlas, Scribe Valdez had already arrived with Dr. Blackburn and he was facing a hostile interrogation from Knight Shin. Paladin Romani and Knight Shin disagreed over what to do with their prisoner. Having heard what he had done with the abductees and all that he was planning to do, Knight Shin wanted to execute him on the spot. Paladin Romani favored a more cautious approach, as she considered that they might need the doctor at some point. The Initiate again questioned Dr. Blackburn, and he revealed that he had associates working out of the old Westec facility, where they were preparing to distribute his corrected FEV. Knight Shin wanted to kill Blackburn and level the laboratory, but Paladin Romani overruled him. She ordered the Initiate to Westec, saying that whatever punishment they would eventually mete out to Dr. Blackburn, it would have to wait until the immediate threat had been dealt with. The Initiate arrived at Westec and found the basement level overrun with Hellcat mercenaries. Once these foes had been laid low, the Paladin, Knight, and Dr. Blackburn arrived at the Night Shin attempted to get information on the defenses, but Dr. Blackburn claimed to have no knowledge of his associates' preparations in that regard. When asked about his associates, Dr. Blackburn listed them as Dr. Farha, Dr. Jane, and Nellie Wright. With this, the Brotherhood and Blackburn moved ahead to where they could speak with these associates. When the Brotherhood and Blackburn arrived outside the secured control room, a standoff ensued. Dr. Blackburn's associates refused to allow the Brotherhood entry, and the Brotherhood wasn't going to release the Doctor. That's when Dr. Blackburn broke the stalemate, telling those assembled that he had included functionality in the distribution system that was engaged and could not be stopped without his intervention. He offered a trade, spare his colleagues' lives, and he would disable the distribution. The only way to disable it, though, was to release him and let him return to his colleagues. After a discussion, Dr. Blackburn was released with the order to disable the distribution system. While Night Shin disagreed with this decision, the Paladin saw no other way forward. Unsurprisingly, it was a ruse. As soon as he was safely with his associates, Dr. Blackburn ordered Nellie Wright to prep the test chamber. He had decided that the best way to resolve the situation was to show the Brotherhood evidence of his success. He would dose himself with his FEV and they would see that he was right. Blackburn entered the test chamber and prepared for the FEV as the Brotherhood followed close behind. As the FEV turned Blackburn into a super mutant behemoth, 
it became immediately clear that he had failed. Paladin Romani, Knight Shin, and the Initiate put him down after a lengthy battle. Now, the only loose string was Blackburn's colleagues. After speaking with them on the intercom, they agreed to let the Brotherhood in. Entering the control room from the rear, the Brotherhood found the scientists waiting where they had left them. Doctors Jane and Farha were apologetic and explained that they had only hoped to help humanity. They offered up their scientific expertise if the Brotherhood spared them. Nellie Wright seemed more so annoyed than fearful or remorseful. Speaking amongst themselves, the Paladin and the Knight came to a breaking point. Nightshin believed that with everything these scientists had done, and what they would have done without intervention, that the death penalty was warranted. On the other hand, Paladin Romani hated the thought of destroying so much knowledge. What Dr. Blackburn had had them do was evil, but he was gone. She tried to get Knight Shin to agree that even if the outcome was bad, the intention to make a better world was admirable. Knight Shin refused to agree with that point. Regardless of their intentions, the outcome would have been horrific. Paladin Romani, frustrated with his obstinate attitude, asked if this was fallout from the Hellstorm. They had gotten people killed while trying to do the right thing. Was he trying to make amends for that by taking it out on these three? Nightshin rebutted her and stated there would be no more experiments. They were too dangerous to be left alive. The scientists started to panic as Shin spoke of executing them. While the paladin tried to calm the situation by telling them they would take them back as captives to work under Scribe Valdez, the knight became more confrontational. The paladin proclaimed that keeping them alive was the purpose of the Brotherhood. They were supposed to preserve technology, and individuals with their training and knowledge were rare. Nightshin argued the converse. Killing them was the purpose of the Brotherhood. These scientists had been responsible for the deaths of dozens. Had they completed their work, it might well have been hundreds or even thousands that ended up like Dr. Blackburn. The Brotherhood was meant to protect humanity from itself. Paladin Romani accused Knight Shin of using this as a coping mechanism to avoid the guilt he felt. It seems that though the decision to stay and fight the Raiders had been Romani's call, it had been Knight Shin who had distributed the Hellstorm launchers in complete violation of Brotherhood dogma. He had wanted to give the settlers a chance, but it had gotten them killed. The lesson he had taken from the Hellstorm was not to be blinded by emotion. Though it had been compassionate to try to help the settlers, he blamed his compassion for their deaths. He brought that lesson into their current predicament, and it told him that the right thing to do was to end the danger. He wouldn't budge on this point. And so, the schism that erupted at the transmitter at Enclave Site J finally reached the breaking point. Paladin Romani wouldn't allow the execution of the scientists, Night Shin wouldn't let them live. Whichever the Initiate chose to support would lead Fort Atlas, and the other would be forced out of the Brotherhood. The simple truth is that we don't know the canonical outcome of this dispute, so I'll provide both. Should the Initiate have chosen to support Paladin Romani, the events proceeded as follows. Faced with being the odd man out, Nightshin declared his belief that Paladin Romani would use Blackburn's associates to build new weapons of mass destruction, that her false brotherhood would bring chaos for her own gain. Paladin Romani responded that the Brotherhood's mission had always been to use science to guide a better world, and that rather than simply murder great minds, she would shape them into people that would serve that mission, that they would make the world a better place without barbarians like Night Shin. At this, Night Shin declared his separation from her illegitimate branch of the Brotherhood. He would return to California with those initiates he could trust, and tell the elders of their failures from the Hellstorm to the failure to execute the scientists. Paladin Romani told him to take those initiates loyal to him. She only wanted those initiates that were willing to lend a helping hand, not a killing blow. With a final insult about her irresponsibility, Night Shin left, warning her that the elders would judge her. The scientists expressed their thanks for having spared their lives. Paladin Romani ordered the Initiate to return to Fort Atlas. She would escort the scientists back herself. Upon returning to Fort Atlas, Paladin Romani announced the Brotherhood's success against the Super Mutants, followed by the news of the departure of Shin. She referred to him as Shin rather than by his title, as she had stripped him of it. She expressed that she would work with him again in a second if he were to agree to it, but she knew that he never would. He was entirely loyal to the Elders. She closed her comments with the awarding of the rank of Knight Errant to the former Vault Dweller. She explained to her audience that the role of Knight is a dedicated responsibility, and that the former Vault Dweller has too many other obligations to fill that rank, but that the services they rendered to the Brotherhood had made them worthy of respect. The newly minted Knight Errant then spoke to some of those assembled, accepting their congratulations and sharing in their concern about the departure of Shin. Generally speaking, the Brotherhood without Night Shin will likely grow more compassionate if a bit less organized. On the other hand, should the Initiate have chosen to support Night Shin, the events proceeded as follows. Dr. Farha attempted to take the blame for the events, asking the Initiate to spare her associates. Paladin Romani told her not to worry. She would escort her back to Fort Atlas. Night Shin refused to allow this, telling her that her righteous crusade had gone too far. 
She wasn't a paladin, not since the destruction of the transmitter at Enclave Site J. Romani expressed her dawning revelation that the Brotherhood couldn't be changed, that she would have to start over elsewhere. She wanted to make an organization that would provide the outreach that the world needs. Naishin told her that the Brotherhood were protectors, not a charity, and he ordered the execution be carried out. Not wanting to watch what followed, Romani left West Tech. As the Initiate began the execution, Doctors Jane and Farha cowered in fear as Nellie Wright swung a blade at them. Satisfied with the conclusion, Night Shin ordered the Dweller to return to Fort Atlas. Upon returning to the fort, Night Shin announced the Brotherhood's success against the Super Mutants, followed by the news of the departure of Romani. He expressed that her values and those of the Brotherhood could no longer be reconciled, that she had betrayed the Brotherhood when she cut them off from the Elders. He told them that her final misconduct was refusing to punish the criminals behind the mutant threat. She couldn't bear the weight of justice and instead chose exile. While he criticized her, he still expressed that he knew, as misguided as her actions were, that she always acted with the intent to help humanity. He closed his comments with the awarding of the rank of Knight Errant to the former Vault Dweller. The newly minted Knight Errant then spoke to some of those assembled, accepting their congratulations and sharing in their concern about the departure of Romani. Generally speaking, the Brotherhood without Paladin Romani will likely grow more orderly, if a bit less compassionate. Alright, that's all I could find on the story of the Brotherhood First Expeditionary Force up to this point. This was a lot of information, I know, and there's still more to come, but I thought it was first important to point out some connections between this story and the other Brotherhood stories. First, we have the competition between the two drives of the Brotherhood of Steel, preserving technology and protecting people. I've spoken about this issue before, so I'll just say this. These are both important goals, and a balanced focus is the key to the Brotherhood's success. We can see the struggle between these two foci and the contest between Paladin Romani and Knight Shin in Appalachia, and between Elder Lions and the Outcasts in the Capital Wasteland. When the Brotherhood shifts to focusing too intensely on the preservation of technology, they struggle. We can see instances of this problem in the original Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel from 2086 to 2095, and in the Mojave chapter in 2282. Paladin Integrity followed Maxon's 2086 directive. She shifted her branch's focus away from protecting people. Because of this, the Brotherhood's relationship with the Responders fell apart. When the threat of the Scorched Beasts began to rise, the Responders didn't believe the Brotherhood's claims about them. Because the post-war society was fractured like this, the Scorched Beasts picked off the groups one at a time. As for the Mojave chapter under Elder McNamara in 2282, there seem to be a number of issues between the NCR and the Brotherhood, but they stem from the same improperly intense focus on preserving technology over protecting people. The problems created by this left them huddled in a bunker by the time the courier arrived in the Mojave. I even get the feeling that High Elder Maxon felt the Brotherhood was shifting too far into preserving technology from his conversation with Paladin Taggarty. He complains that those around him, including his own son, have become too insular. The second overarching connection comes from West Tech and FEV. The discovery of the FEV experiments undertaken by West Tech at the Mariposa military base and in Huntersville were foundational to the creation of the Brotherhood of Steel. Now, 27 years later, the Brotherhood is forced to contend with Dr. Blackburn and his colleagues at a West Tech facility as they prepare to release FEV into the local population. The world changed dramatically between 2077 and 2102. Captain Maxon executed the scientists at Mariposa for their horrific experiments. Paladin Romani had to view the actions of Dr. Farha, Dr. Jane, and Nellie Wright in a new context. They had very likely been aware of Dr. Blackburn's twisted experiments, but they were also university-trained researchers in a world that didn't have universities anymore. This last conflict between Shin and Romani also serves to show a point of conflict between the Brotherhood's two main missions. What's the proper path forward when one priority says they have to die because they're a risk to the people, while the other one says they have to be saved as technology must be preserved? While Paladin Romani recognize the potential threat they pose and that they can't be allowed to roam freely, she's willing to take a compromised position of enforced community service through guided research for the Brotherhood. Nightshin's rigidity doesn't allow such a compromise to take place. Anyway, that's enough on the themes, let's get to the notes I mentioned before. First, a little housekeeping. I told this story as I experienced it the first time through supporting Paladin Romani. I added details from my experience going through it a second time supporting Night Shin. This may not be exactly how you experience the content because there are so many points at which the story can be altered by skill checks and choices. For example, if your special isn't high enough in the makeshift vault, the conversation with Pierce ends in combat rather than a surrender. While this at the outset appears to be a big change, Pierce doesn't die in combat. Instead, we capture him 
and he tells us he won't reveal the source of the Hellstorm launchers except on Raider territory, at which point he's released and we meet him at Crater, with no lasting changes to the story. The broad strokes of the story are maintained. The only real choice comes with a final schism. Second, a little more housekeeping. You may have noticed some overlap in the early parts of this video and other videos of mine. Specifically, if you just watched part one of this so far two-part story, or my video on Huntersville, I detail the origin of the Brotherhood in California in both of those videos. I also gave a fairly broad strokes overview of the original Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel here. I felt that this was important to show the connections between the Brotherhood's origins and the choices made by Paladin Romani and Knight Shin in 2103 and 2104. Third, I'm going to produce a video covering a hypothetical route that the expedition could have taken. I included the known details of their route in this video, but I've taken some time to look over the map, and I think I've found a potential route they could have taken to get from the Lost Hills bunker to the Atlas Observatory. Fourth, there's some items in this content that were never fully addressed. For example, why are the super mutants in Uncanny Caverns white with red war paint? Why was the Bish Pipeline Station a secret location? I wish we'd gotten answers to these questions. Fifth, I believe Paladin Romani wanted to return the Brotherhood to its pre-2086 ideals of both protecting people and preserving technology. She had truly believed in that form of the Brotherhood. She couldn't convince the elders in California that that was the proper form of their organization, so she volunteered for this mission to set up her own Brotherhood as far from California as she could. Many of the elders were just as happy to see her go as she was to leave them behind. Sixth, when it comes to the best choice for the leadership of the Appalachian Brotherhood in terms of Shin or Romani, I say the third option, both. They're ideological opposites of each other in some ways, and when they work together, they create a better outcome than when either one works alone. That said, working within the constraints of the available choices, I believe Paladin Romani is the better choice. Night Shin is a strict adherent to the Western Brotherhood's mistaken idea that preservation of technology should always take precedence over preserving human life, and that it's too dangerous to share tech with the average wastelander. This idea is, in the long term, a big part of why they fail. It's why by the time of Fallout New Vegas, they're a weird sect separate and apart from a society that's managing to slowly recover from the war. Because they refuse to reconnect and share the technology they've preserved, they have no future with the rest of the world. Seventh, I was thinking about what Knight Shin would do after leaving for California. He basically has two options, walk to California or attempt to reconnect electronically. I'll talk about the latter option in Note 8, but assuming he walked back to California, I don't think there'd be a second expeditionary force coming anytime soon. The first expeditionary force was dispatched to find technology and to investigate what had happened to the original Appalachian Brotherhood of Steel. The second objective was complete, and the first objective could be done almost anywhere, including in nearby territory. While Romani did break their rules, I have a hard time believing they would dispatch another group across the country just to punish her. I could easily see them stripping her of her title in absentia, and potentially even finding a way to send a message to her in Appalachia, but I don't see them risking another group just to bring some clerical justice. From a practical perspective, should Romani's Brotherhood survive, it would be an ally to the Western Brotherhood, and should they send operatives east for some reason, Fort Atlas would serve as a safe place to rest and restock. Eighth, as I mentioned before, should Paladin Romani retain control of the Appalachian Brotherhood, Night Shin leaves to make contact with the Western Brotherhood. While the transmitter at Enclave Site J is broken, Shin could potentially find a new transmitter at Mount Weather. For those of you who don't know, Mount Weather, along with Raven Rock and the bunker at the Greenbrier, the real world equivalent of the White Spring, was established as a site meant in part to maintain the continuity of government in the aftermath of nuclear war. It's just 20 miles south southwest of Harbors Ferry in the real world and it's home to the National Emergency Alert System. What site closer would be more likely to operate as a communications facility? The only problem with this site is that it likely has an enclave presence due to it being so similar in purpose to the Congressional Bunker in Raven Rock. I'm hopeful that this will play some role in the future of Fallout 76. Ninth, Hellstorm launchers in-game do not match their lore. The lore has them as a terrible and deadly weapon capable of obliterating several people with a single shot. In-game, it can take multiple shots from one of these launchers to take down a single mole miner. I understand completely that that character wasn't specced into increased explosive damage, and that if the weapon did match the lore, it would be overpowered for standard gameplay. It's still disappointing to discover, though. Tenth, I think it's possible that one of the reasons the Brotherhood is so interested in reclaiming and storing the Hellstorm launchers 
is that they're a real danger to power armor. Like I said before, the gameplay doesn't match the lore, but going with a lore version of the weapon, they're probably one of the more dangerous weapons to the Brotherhood of Steel. Eleventh, I don't know if I believe Marsha Leon's story about the Hellstorm, at least not entirely. She says that the Brotherhood distributed the launchers to the general population, which we know to be true. She then says that the raiders just took them and killed the settlers. That doesn't sound reasonable. I think she has it backwards. They killed them, then took the launchers. Why would they just hand the launchers over? Marcia even says she thinks that if they just surrendered, her mother would still be alive. So they didn't surrender, at least according to Marcia. But what is the raiders taking the launchers without a fight other than a surrender? I think what happened here was there was a battle. The settlers, who were not properly trained, killed as many of themselves as they did of the raiders with the launchers. The raiders then took the launchers from the dead defenders. Marcia blames the Brotherhood for her mother's death, but I think they're just a convenient scapegoat. If the raiders going after her town were anything like Dagger's Blood Eagles at the retreat, they would have just bled the town dry and then taken it when the settlers couldn't pay anymore. The sad truth is that her mother would likely be dead either way, and without the Brotherhood, she and her brother would likely be dead as well. I'm not by any means saying that the Brotherhood are the perfect angelic saviors they want to be. I don't like that Night Shin thought it was okay to simply seize the makeshift vault, but I do believe that Paladin Romani's Brotherhood is a force for good, even if they do make some missteps. Twelfth, when producing this video, I began to wonder at the origin of the titles Paladin and Knight Errant. According to Wikipedia, the highest source, Paladin originated with legends of twelve knights closest to Charlemagne, and is derived from the Latin Palatinus. In Middle French, Paladin meant of the palace. While many romantic portrayals had the Paladins as holy warriors, it entered modern fantasy in 1975 as a character class for Dungeons and Dragons. It's interesting to me that Maxon chose this as the title for the knights closest to him given its historical context in relation to Charlemagne. It makes me wonder if it was a way for him to link himself to Charlemagne, at least in terms of perceived importance. Charlemagne is seen as the first great ruler in Western Europe after the collapse of the Roman Empire. As for Knight Errant, it appears to have originated in medieval chivalric romance literature, and it referred to roving knights that wander the countryside searching for adventure. Thirteenth, when talking about the monasteries of Western Europe and how they kept the knowledge of the Roman Empire alive, I want to be sure and note that this wasn't the only place that knowledge was maintained. It is absolutely true that these monasteries maintained libraries of the works of Roman authors that would have otherwise been lost. That being said, much of the knowledge of the empire was maintained by Byzantium and eventually the rising Islamic empires. Fourteenth, I have to admit that I was somewhat disappointed with how things turned out at the Atlas Observatory after the arrival of the Brotherhood. I played the Fallout 76 beta four years ago, and the very first site I chose to explore was the Atlas Observatory. I saw the icon on the map, and I had to see what was going on there. In investigating it, I was floored to discover that it was a weather machine, and couldn't help but notice the repair points and the substructure that made it seem like we might get an event here, like those involved in powering up the nuclear power plants. I thought we'd get the opportunity to take temporary control of the weather in Appalachia, or possibly that we'd get to use the site to return proper seasons to the region. Those dreams were dashed by Scribe Valdez's inspection, but as you'll see in my next point, I haven't given up all hope. Fifteenth, I believe that the presence of the Ultrasite battery cell at the Atlas Observatory is proof that the observatory was once an enclave site. I believe this because of the content added to the White Spring with a pit update. Orlando, who at this time appears to be a representative of the Enclave, dispenses these same cells for use in the Vertibird. As this has made me come to view these as Enclave tech, I now believe we have proof that the Atlas Observatory is connected to the Enclave. I don't believe that Dr. Hammond, the scientist behind the project, was a member, but it does seem that the Enclave was interested in this technology. Keeping this in mind, how fitting would it be for the weather control technology from the Atlas Observatory to end up at an Enclave facility at Mount Weather? Sixteenth, the Brotherhood has a gladiator team that battles the Rust Eagle robots at Metal Dome. They do this to investigate the dangerous robotic army they fear could be raised at the site just north of Fort Atlas. Initiate Pappas, the head of the team, can be found at Fort Atlas when he's not battling. Seventeenth, with the introduction of the pit content, there's a new Brotherhood initiate at the White Spring Resort. Initiate Ellison was born in Louisiana, but he moved to Appalachia as a small child. His brother and mother still live in the area, with his brother staying on the farm while he joined up with the Brotherhood. When the Brotherhood saw a vertebrate taking off from the White Spring, Scribe Valdez sent him to investigate. Lastly, there are two random encounters related to this content, and one unlockable light ally. The two random encounters are with Felton Reed and the Brotherhood of Zeal. Felton Reed is a new Brotherhood initiate training to be a scribe. When found in the wilderness, he asks you for assistance in picking an adequate piece of technology to return to the Brotherhood. 
As for the Brotherhood of Zeal, they're the Brotherhood imposters that robbed Sean Hawkman in 2103. I call them the Brotherhood of Zeal, as that's what one of the Dunderheads calls their group. There are three members, Barry, Buck, and Barnaby. When encountered, any one of the three can potentially be leading the group. In my case, it was Barry who was in command, and he requested five caps to help them continue with their immoral claws. Though Barnaby reminded him that he's supposed to demand 50 caps, I chose instead to put the imposters down. The unlockable light ally is Dr. Solomon Hardy. Dr. Hardy was born in Detroit. After graduating high school, he served in the army, eventually leaving to go back to school to study medicine. He was in his final year at medical school when the bombs came down, so technically speaking, he never became a doctor, but he has gained a lot of experience over the years. He eventually took on Erica Hewson as an apprentice until they both joined the Brotherhood as they trekked across the country. Dr. Hardy was unlockable as part of the Season 3 scoreboard from December 15th, 2020 to April 27th, 2021. If you still want to unlock him, his medic station is available from the Settlers of Foundation for 4,000 bullion at ally level reputation. Anyway, I think that will do it for the story of the Brotherhood First Expeditionary Force. Whew. If you want to receive notifications when I launch these lore videos, you can follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. I'm going to attempt to stream more often on YouTube when I have the time, so if you're interested, come check it out. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Jill AWS, Dark Malcontent of Metaverse Studios, Brian, and Real76 for their support. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time. This journey ahead, we're going to need to rely on each other with unwavering support. The toughest trials have yet to come. But remember, we're more than a brotherhood now. We're family.